Welcome to this video. Yeah, a new game that I played in the European Club Cup in Bilbao about two weeks ago. And um, yeah, this is the second game of the event for me. It was the fourth round of the tournament as already um, explained in the first video of the series. I had missed the first two rounds due to league game in Germany. So the third round we played my Belgium team played against uh, a team from Austria, from Salzburg, and um, um, I was playing on board five and my opponent was a feed master, still is a feed master, Alman Durakovic from uh, Bosnia actually, Bosnian um, nationality. Um, yeah, he's a feed master, he's rated 2345. Uh, 2, at the time and uh, my preparation was um, yeah pretty brief to be honest because it was a quite uh, surprising experience um, he has a good rating 2345 but I only had uh, like 80 90 games in the database which is very very uh, few um, to compare um, I've got like 350 games in the database and this is for a player of my strength very very um, small number I didn't play so much over the years and his 90 games is like uh, like nothing so it was a very difficult um, time to prepare and he also had switched uh, around with openings um, however what I did recognize is from the preparation this person had gained rating points in the last years like very constantly each list he gained like 10 20 rating points which showed me that he was pretty much constantly playing above his level and uh, he even had gained recently points to come from 2200 something above 2300 so he, his play made a very decent impression um, on me so i was uh, thinking okay uh, let's go play it safe, play knight f3. Yeah, one reason for knight f3 is I mix it up between d4, knight f3, sometimes c4. And uh, he was uh, playing some kind of Benoni's, uh, Blumenfeld's, these kind of openings. And uh, I didn't really feel well prepared against those. So I wanted to have a, a slightly quite alive, play knight f3, c4. Um, here, he had mostly played um, lines like e6 or b6 yeah something something uh, like that was um, in the games or or even uh, the odd queen's gambit um, however he surprised me in the game he played g6 which he never had played before so any preparation that in this case was brief was obsolete basically yeah the king's indian and uh, yeah, here white has a slight choice. Most people play bishop e2 without even thinking that much. It is the main line. I have played h3 quite often here also in my blitz games. If you um, have watched some of my channel, h3 I play very frequently. However, I recently have looked at some lines in the classical with bishop e2. And uh, this is why I played bishop e2 in this game. I wanted to to try those uh, so those lines out. However, he played c5. Okay, so not e5, the main king's Indian move, but c5. Yeah, c5 is a very decent alternative, actually. It is rarely played because it does not fit so well within the king's Indian in, uh, in one or two lines. And exactly the line that we have on the board now, or get on the board, is one of the reasons. Um, it is in fact quite interesting to play for black if white plays d5. We transpose to Benoni, where black is already, I guess, quite happy to see the setup with bishop e2 and not with bishop d3 or yeah, let alone anything where the f pawn is involved. So this is a pretty decent Benoni. White can play that, of course, but certainly something that black does not mind and my opponent had experience in the benoni i quickly played castles which is uh, the main move here anyway um it basically invites black to take on d4 and transpose into the very well known maroxy bind 
Black, in fact, does not have really a better move. Um, some people try to play knight c6 here yeah, to stay yeah, out of the Maroxy, uh, but here d5 is a good line for white after d5. Black loses time with his knight, he needs to misplace it on a5 or get a double pawn after knight e5, it's, it's not really great. So my opponent also took on d4. Okay, so I captured, he went knight c6, bishop e3, the Maroxy bind. Uh, normally coming from the Sicilian, accelerated dragon, or sometimes out of English openings like c4, c5. Um, now we come to a first small po important point. He now took on d4. I think this is um, um, a good move order for black, to be honest. Lots of people play this move, which uh, is the, arguably the main line. After bishop d7, white, however, has the opportunity to play the move knight c2, a move that uh, for years has been, I think, uh, largely underestimated. In recent years, it has become clear that this is a strong option. Um, yeah, to be honest, I, I have suspected this for ages. I play this move like since I play uh, this whole opening because it was recommended uh, to me uh, by a friend and I have a fantastic score with this structure, keeping more pieces on the board. Black is somewhat cramped. He's got um, many pieces, all pieces, in fact, for a little space, and he likes to exchange pieces. This is why Black really here took the chance to get this knight off first and then play bishop d7. Yeah, he tries to take, uh, he tries to reverse the moves, so to say. In the other move order, bishop d7, white sometimes plays queen d2. This is the old main line, not, queen, not knight c2. And after that, black captures and plays this move. And what he does in the game, or tries to do in the game, is to get a transposition of moves. He took first, takes bishop d7. Yeah, and um, here I must admit that I, I had a hard time to remember um, if this move order has any uh, substantial drawback. I actually looked this up now and found out that um, one way to try to, um, uh, to punish black for this move order is the move queen to d3. I, thought, I briefly thought about it during the game, but then I, I thought that, okay, come on, let's, let's just play the, the normal main line, which is also a comfortable option so i didn't go go for that the idea of queen d3 is that it lends uh, additional protection to the e4 pawn um, there might be something like that happening bishop c6 and now f4 this is a big difference to the queen placement on d2 with the queen on d2 white basically is forced to lend further protection to e4 like bishop f3 bishop d3 and here the queen is protecting that Something like this is a rather attractive position for white. This was recently reached in a in a game between Austrian number one Markus Raga against Mamedov in Dubai 2014. I think this is probably a blitz or rapid game from this huge event. Um, however, it's a it's a good a good line. Yeah, this queen d3 is, is very interesting. Um, I didn't go for that. I just played queen d2, sort of allowing the transposition to the traditional main line. Bishop c6, here takes the e4 pawn. I cover that. Black plays a5. Yeah, a5 is a typical move. What black wants to do is he wants to secure the c5 square for his knight. This square. This is the idea. The knight wants to come to c5. And this is what he's doing now. I played b3. Yeah, making sure that after a move like a4, I go b4 and have a good structure on the queen side with the a pawn being potentially weak. Um, of course, he went knight d7. And here, an important moment, it is clear that white has all the pawns on light squares, almost all of them, and the dark squared bishop. And you definitely very rarely want to exchange your dark squared bishop when you have the, so many pawns on dark uh, on light squares, so your dark squares would be severely weakened after the trade. I definitely want to keep the bishop on the board. So bishop e3, black played knight c5, and uh, this also initiates a typical regrouping that he's now uh, uh, getting in. Queen to b6, rook f to c8, 
and queen to d8 back. So this kind of regrouping. Queen here, rook here, and then the queen probably wants to drop back. What is white's plan? White has basically two main plans. He can try to advance on the queen side with a3 and b4. This would be nice to get in. However, there's some pressure on b3 and the whole queen side. Not so easy to do. I am preparing this. I play rook a b1. He went queen b6. And now rook fc1. This is a good prep move that covers the c3 knight as well. Yeah, black played rook f to c8. Yeah, joining the action on the queen side. Yeah, here is an interesting, an interesting moment. If I go a3 now, a3, you can uh, look at this. It looks, it looks weird, but this is hanging. Need to be very cautious with uh, with moving uh, pawns on the queen side. I want, I want the further strengthening of the position. I went rook c2, rook c2. Yeah, this has uh, multiple ideas. One idea is if black now tries to play a move like that, trying to prevent a3, white even has this move, queen c1, to push the queen back. Rook c2 is a, is a, is a move that I still knew, that is a, that is a theoretical move. Um, yeah, black of course didn't play queen b4. He went just back to d8. Yeah, getting out of this this pin. Yeah, now if white now tries to play this this space gaining move with a3, the move a4 comes into consideration for black. The point being that all of a sudden the knight is starting a, a weird invasion on b3. So this does not convince as well. What white needs to do is he needs to uh, prepare further. I went bishop to f1. Oops, not that. Bishop to f1. Bishop to f1. Yeah, um, what about this move? What does it do? It um, allows a further strengthening of the position by white. Mainly the idea knight e2 to d4 or knight b5 to d4. Yeah? Knight b5 he might take. So the bishop here is, um, is giving me an additional option to to free the e2 square. It's also a good strengthening move. The bishop on f1 is getting out of the way of, uh, of some pieces. It also asks black, what are you doing next? Black now went queen to f8. Uh, a, a weird looking move at first. What is the point? It has a point. Black's idea is to play um, you know, two things. It could be bishop to f6 and then queen to g7 building up pressure on the long diagonal. The second idea could be h5, king to h7. Let's get rid of some of those. h5, king to h7, and then bishop to h6. Exchanging the dark squared bishop. As mentioned, I want to keep those bishops on the board and a trade would definitely be something that black welcomes. Yeah, here I really wasn't sure how to continue. And um, after a moment, I came up with knight d5. Um, I wasn't I wasn't really sure because I have little experience in this um, precise position. I have far more experience when the knight is on c2, when I get this retreat um, going in. Uh, yeah, knight d5. The idea is simple. Knight b6 wins an exchange. <laughs> uh, yeah, so black is basically obliged to take the piece. It's uh, very often a big problem, or not a big problem, but a big feature of those Maroxi bind structures. The knight on d5 is a very, very annoying piece. And black is very often not really able to play e6 and to drive it away. Here it loses the exchange, uh, e6, but also in general, if he tries to prepare that, like knight d7 back e6, that's all costs uh, lots of time and at the end the d6 pawn will be weak. So one problem of the Maroxi is that this uh, post on d5 is very annoying. Black very often is, uh, is basically forced to take the piece and this is what he did. He took on d5. Yeah, and here we come to an interesting moment. Um, Actually, when we reached this position, I 
Um, of course, I had played knight d5 with the idea to capture with the e-pawn, which is the, the normal recapture. If we look at uh, the recaptures, the this one is maybe slightly more interesting than usual because I'm yeah I'm already close to doubling on the C file and I have this this square, but still the capture with the C pawn is a bit lame because very likely there will be trades on the C file, and uh, the whole structure is symmetrical. It's difficult to really get some some opening of the position in. So this I have discarded uh, quite quickly, and e takes d5 is the way it normally is played, just from a structural point of view. I didn't know the exact position, but this is what normally is done. The d-pawn is there to make sure that the e-pawn on e7 is not moving easily. It should be on e7. And what white is trying to do is, uh, long term, to get pressure against the pawn, like let's say both rooks here, and then pressurize the e7 pawn. This is um, the way it is normally played. Yeah, I have found some games with that. Like they could could go like that. Um, where is it actually? Um, here. Yeah, something like rook c7, a3, b6, bishop g5, and uh, yeah, here in this concrete game, black weakened himself a bit. This was between um, um, oops, former. Uh, did I just uh, delete the whole thing? <laughs> I guess, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jumping back, but it, it's quickly. Between former FIDE world champion Alexander Khalifman and a German, uh, a German player, um, Stefan Bernd. Um, yeah, e to xd5 is, is, is a good choice. And of course, I was aware that this is the normal way to, to take. However, when I was sitting there, I was thinking, hmm, well, what about queen d5? Nobody ever takes with the queen. Is this a bad move? And I wasn't sure. I thought that it could be an interesting idea. I never saw it really that someone is taking with a, with a piece. So I went for it. Yeah, it it seems to be worse, uh, objectively speaking, than the e pawn capture. But I was I was somehow interviewed by the idea to do that. Um, yeah, I was thinking, isn't this maybe still a bit of an advantage for white? I have this idea still to play a3, b4, and if I get in a3, b4, which seems likely yeah, that, I, that I manage that, then even c5 might come, like b4 and c5, ultimately that also would free my bishop. I was thinking, oh, isn't this still a slight advantage? Maybe. Maybe, and I can still, I don't see how black is, is equalizing easily or making a draw. Um, it's clear that I'm not threatening to win a pawn. Um, what we uh, what we can look at, he went bishop h6, which is a good move. I, I definitely don't want to grab a pawn here. That, that's very important. Um, yeah, a black, black has, uh, I mean, Apart from the fact that this queen looks like it's getting trapped, I'm not sure at the moment if this happens, but also the dark squares are so weak, I don't want to do that. Also this, this for example, if we just look at this from a strategic point of view, black getting uh, the bishop here on this fantastic square, this is just rubbish for white. Never, white never ever should allow that. Black is, is far better here, so that's really no option. I want to keep it on the board, so bishop not taking, of course, but bishop f2. Yeah, here he surprised me. I didn't really, I didn't really expect it the next move, but it was a good move. He played a good game here anyway. It was uh, there was just one one soft spot. Um, rook c6. I, I was surprised because I thought that this rook is somewhat clumsily placed when a3 before it's. But we see a3, he went to bishop f4, b4, takes, takes, and knight back to d7. Yeah, and here an interesting moment. I went c5. I could have considered to play g3 immediately, but this, this looked, looked a bit lame to me. If I go g3, 
he just let's say he just uh, um, sorry he just drops back I go c5 yeah I'm using this this pin of the the d pawn but he can just play rook c7 this is uh, really a problem my rook on c2 is unprotected so I'm not really threatening to take on d6 and black is maybe just going here with the tempo and then he will take yeah black's uh, position is very very compact he has uh, little weaknesses so this is not really really great um yeah i decided to play c5 immediately queen h6 g3 and bishop e3 so black finally got this uh, got this uh, the straight in that he what he wanted all the time i still thought i might have a slight pull i went bishop b5 and uh, he went rook c7 i think this is necessary black does not have anything dramatic yeah, like this for example i just take the the rook this is just just a check really and uh, here black is out of any firepower he only attacks with the knight and there's not nothing happening here he has to play rook c7 but it is uh, it is uh, sufficient rook c7 yeah yeah and here i was uh, slowly but surely recognizing that um, i really don't have anything here at the end i took on d7 and played b5 my only idea left is uh, is a pass pawn the c pawn yeah and in fact i get i get this pawn i could have played um c6 immediately by the way takes takes but he goes there b5 and after something like that queen e3 secures good counterplay yeah the queen is entering and uh, some, some something like that um it's just like he's defending with all heavy pieces and my king is also slightly insecure i really don't have any winning chances here it's debatable what's 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 tougher if this is was maybe a bit more a bit more testing than what i did i'm i'm really not sure yeah i played as mentioned i played b5 immediately he uh, played rook c7 and i went c6 establishing the pawn yeah and now black has a very forcing continuation that he also played black took black took took on f2 rook takes and queen e3 setting up this pin very annoying yeah my rook is not participating here to support my pawn yeah i went king g2 and he played queen c5 yeah we see that black's um black's forces are working well together yeah he's um putting pressure on the c6 pawn i really don't um, don't have um, any any way forward here um i can for example if i trade here he will take rook b7 and he just takes here and then marches the c pawn which is uh, which is a very drawish position probably it will end in a draw i wanted to to test him a bit more i mean yeah not like i had huge hopes but i wanted to try to play a bit more complicated i went instead of this queen capture i went rook b7 played rook b7 yeah and here yeah i was hoping for something like queen c6 which is uh, which is of course not very good but okay he didn't he didn't uh, didn't fail for that of course i mean when i say hoping it's not like expecting but there are those things in the position um if uh, black takes on c6 uh, with the the rook by the way i will um probably just trade and we get um, a comparable position to what we had before i was in fact quite surprised or a bit surprised um uh, that he uh, that he answered with a different move he went uh, um rook a to c8 yeah okay i mean this is not spoiling anything or, or or whatever but i still thought the other thing is easier i went rook a2 intending rook a7 yeah and now now to be honest now came the surprise here i was really thinking okay yeah i'm threatening to take c5 and play rook a7 and um yeah what what he should probably just take c6 now and uh, we just continue from there with the equal position but he played e6 
which was uh, really shocking. I thought, uh, wow, why is, why is this happening? Now I took on c5 and I could play rook a to um, a7. And this is dangerous now a bit. Black, of course, cannot take because I take with the pawn and then rook a8 will, will promote my b-pawn. So very easy win. Which means, as I'm threatening rook takes c7, he only has the rook capture. After which I all of a sudden enter on the 7th rank. Yeah, very nice. I have uh, doubled rooks on the 7th rank. And this uh, kind of active rooks also mean that I have a draw in the back, by the way. Yeah? He went c4. Didn't have much time. He only had little time left. Um, so I have a draw in the back. I can always give checks on the 7th. And it means that I'm the one playing for a win, as I can uh, decide when the game should end or <laughs> uh, if I ever want to uh, want to continue. And now, now, here I really made a mistake and and a huge one, because I was thinking in this position. Okay, yeah, I can give a check on g7. Just follow my my train of thought. I can give a check on g7. His king moves. If he moves to h8, I take on h7, check, king g8, and I give check on g7 again. So I have just won a pawn in the process with a check. It, it, it shouldn't be, it should help me. If I play rook g7 check, he goes king f8, I take h7, threatening mate on h8. He needs to go back to g8, and again I can give the check on g7. So I have just won a pawn for, for nothing. So I thought, okay, let's go for that. He had little time on the clock. I had a little bit more. It was not like an hour or whatever, but I had I had, had a sufficient time to think about it, but he had little time. I gave this check and he relatively quickly went to f8. And um, here, without thinking very much, I took h7. He went back and I gave the check again. So I have just netted this pawn. However, here, in this precise position, white has a win because king f8 was the huge blunder. My problem, and this was a very, uh, very stupid thing, I was thinking beforehand, okay, I take h7, and I took that quickly. Um, I have a win, and the win is not very difficult to spot, actually. I can give the check here on f7, king e8, and now there's more than one win, but the most convincing win is e5. The idea of e5 is to take on h7, then move the rook away and then mate. This is really a mate in like a mating idea in one, two, three moves. And black has no defense, absolutely no defense. It's quite, uh, quite fascinating. He has no defense against this. L let's say he plays rook c5, just to give a, a sample line here. Takes here. I go rook a7, and that's it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, really, it's, uh, it's really nice. Oh, wait, um, he can play rook f5, can he? Um, oh, wait, just a moment. Is this the most uh, most precise way to do it? Uh, rook a7, rook f5. Mm, I'm not, not totally sure. Mm, ah, I can go here. This is strong. I really have the time. I have the time to cover f5. And then, uh, then get in rook a7 and this. Uh, okay, uh, this, this is this is the point. Okay, so white is winning like that. Uh, however, I think instead of e5, by the way, I can also just take. That should also win. Here he has this uh, defensive try, but this is uh, of course far far uh, better than than the game and also should win. Yeah, my problem was really that. I did not calculate really. I was just beforehand having this 
kind of logical train of thought, like I give the check and no matter where he goes, I will win a pawn. And I didn't really think about it when he went king f8. I was just playing rook h7 as I had to, as I had planned. Rook af7 would have won. Yeah, I took there, he went back to g8, I gave the check again quickly as planned, and now, whoops, he went to h8. Aha! Okay, and um, yeah, now that's it with the win, the direct win. Yeah, let's take stock. White is a pawn up, and he has doubled on the seventh rank, but how are you going to win? This is a super dangerous pawn. I really took a long time here yeah? and uh, at the end came to the conclusion and uh, rightly, I think the right, sorry, the right conclusion, I just need to retreat my rooks and fight against the c pawn. There is no other way to try to play for a win. Also it should be mentioned that the the match was a super, super close affair. At the end it ended uh, with a with 3-3 tie. So it uh, need be needed to be very uh, very circumspect, not not um, blundering as uh, something and let the C pawn promote or whatever. So need to be cautious. I went with um, number of checks, and now to d7. Yeah, going all the way back, stopping the C pawn, and now Black really has counterplay. He went e5. This is a good move. King f2. Rook c3, and here we see the counterplay. The rook from c3 attacks the f pawn, and this rook is also attacking the f pawn. After king e2, he went rook f8, and this is a counterplay that is strong enough to secure a draw. It is really, um, really nothing that I can do here. I went rook d3, which basically accepts the draw. Um, I could also uh, go rook d2. But then he will take, I take here, note that this is a funny way to blunder the whole thing. Yeah, so better not. Yeah, I went rook d3. He captured, gave the check. Yeah, and here I have no, no way forward. At first I was thinking, okay, maybe I can go here and... Uh, after here, king d2, but he just has uh, rook c4, and I have no no way forward really. King d3, rook d4, and he will get the pawn back. Yeah, that's that's really not not helping. At the end, um, I went I went here. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I I took it I took it. Check and he get the pawn back. Yeah, here we actually, yeah, we could have agreed to a draw, but I wanted to continue a bit. I'm still a bit more active with the king, but black got the pawn back. My only very, very slight hope is the 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 better activity. But of course, black's uh, black's king is in front of the e pawn, so even if he loses the um, the g6 pawn it's not uh, not any problem yeah he played normal moves moves that were totally sufficient to to keep the draw yeah g4 he can just give it away and now get with the king near the near the pawn here we reached <laughs> the the bear kings <laughs> and uh, agreed to a draw so um, a draw in my uh, in my second game. In fact, this 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 match was was really funny. It ended three three as mentioned with six draws, but all draws were fought till bear kings or well till the end. Yeah, so a very tough match um, against this Austrian team. Um, I think this was a uh, I think the draw actually was a very uh, uh, fair result in a way. He only here blundered at one move with king f8 which i failed to, to which i failed to uh, take advantage of because i was not thinking at the point at this point i was just playing the the intended move with rook takes h7 and it didn't i didn't really think about that this is a different issue king f8 or h8 so it was uh, it was a stupid thing so here i could have uh, at one point won quite uh, quite easily but um, other than that, the game was uh, pretty much in a 
in in a, in a state of, of equilibrium. It was very very equal. I think he defended well. So um, yeah, a draw here. Fair result, I believe. I hope you enjoyed the analysis. Thanks for watching.